we've run out of time now. Let's talk about time management. <laughs> Got several approaches to the management of time. Here's the first approach. Ignore the subject. And that's valid. Guys, I say, I've been late all my life. Doesn't look like all this time management stuff's going to work for me. I just ignore it. That's wonderful. And I say that really to make this point. Remember, be a student, not a follower. And here's what you must always do. Design your own personal life. I'm very happy for people to take notes at my seminar, but I'm also just as happy if somebody says, hey, this is not for me. Tear up all these notes and throw them away. That, that's just as valid for me. Right? Remember, be no one's disciple. Chart your own course. Make what you do the product of your own conclusion. So this is, this is valid. Ignore the subject. Here's another approach. Step down to something easier. If you're getting hassled by the management of time, what you're doing, you might want to, you know, change course. What I'm saying here is be your own person. You don't have to be a model of someone else. You don't have to do it like anybody else, right? Do it like yourself. Buy what you want to buy. Listen to what you want to listen to. Make changes if you want to make changes and don't make changes, right? It's your life, I'm telling you. And don't let anybody persuade you any different. Success is not a stereotype. Success is not a Ferrari. Success is not an automobile. It's not a house. It's not a place. It's not money in the bank. It's not a million dollars. That's not success. Success is the continual unfolding of the design of your own life and pulling it off. That's what success is. The continual unfolding of the design of your own personal life and pulling it off in whatever degree you wish. That is success. Successful in doing whatever you want to do that makes sense to you, for you, your family, your responsibilities, or take on responsibilities or refuse responsibilities. That's strictly all up to you. We've been given the power of choice. Every life form except human beings operates by instinct in the genetic code. It has no multiple choice. Only humans have multiple choice. In the winter, the goose flies south. Why? Because he's a goose. Can't fly north, <laughs> couldn't fly west. If you said to the goose, be better to go west this year, he ignores that advice, keeps on flying south. Why? Has no alternative, has no other way. He is only driven, all life form is driven by instinct in the genetic code except human beings. Now, why not human beings? Because here it is, we've been given the dignity of choice. We're not like a robot. We're not stuck like a tree, using up all the nourishment, nothing left, now you die because you can't change location. Not true. Humans can go north, south, east, west. Humans can change, do anything they want to do. We've been given the dignity. But here's what's interesting about all life form except humans. Every life form except humans strives to the max of its potential. How tall will a tree grow? As tall as it possibly can. You never heard of a tree growing half as high as it could. No, no, that is impossible. A tree grows as high as it can, drives down every root it can, produces every leaf it can, extends itself as far as it possibly can. Every life form extends to the max, except human beings. Now, why not human beings? Because we're not robots. We've been given the dignity of choice. And here's a couple of alternatives on the dignity of choice. To be part of or all of, you have the potential to be. And you got the choice. Do a little to make yourself comfortable and forget the rest, or do it all. And there's nobody here to dictate you got to do it all. That's nonsense. You've got to be rich because we live in a rich country. That's nonsense. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to do it all. You can do a little, do some, do some more. Take advice, but don't take orders. Take information, take training, take teaching, but don't take orders from no one that tells you how you need to live and what you need to own and what you need to do. Somebody says, well, you need to be successful. That, that's a personal choice, being successful. What we teach is the possibilities, the possibilities, and everybody chooses. Take a little, take a lot, do some, do nothing. Ignore the subject. This is why I put this in here. You've got to learn to do that. Abraham Lincoln said, since I would be no one's slave, I will be no one's master. Excellent philosophy. If a guy says, hey, I'm soon cashing it in. I'm heading for the mountains. I'm going to live in a little cabin, live off the land, and feed the squirrels. 
If he goes and does that, guess what? He's a smashing success. Why? He's doing what he designed to do and went and did it and pulled it off. You can't say, no, no, that, that's not successful. That is the epitome of success, is giving a design to your life and go pull it off, making progress in that direction that satisfies you. If it doesn't satisfy you, make alternatives and you change. And if you get some better ideas, sure, you may follow someone's suggestion and ideas, but not orders. Design your own life like you want it that will fit. Now, if you take on some responsibilities, no, you've got to consider those. Yes, you can ignore your responsibilities, but you won't feel good about that. Guess what the old prophet said? Some things that taste good now in the mouth turns bitter later in the belly. So you don't want to sacrifice. We all must suffer one of two pains, regardless of your choice of lifestyle and what you want to do. We must all suffer one of two pains, the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. And what we suggest to everybody is to consider the disciplines because disciplines weigh ounces, regrets weigh tons. You don't want to substitute a, a discipline for a regret. In our opinion, that would be a poor choice. Now, you can do it, but some things are poor trade-offs. The old prophet said, what if you gain the whole world, but it cost you your soul? Would that be worth it? And with a bit of intelligence, we say, no, that doesn't seem worth it. Even if you got the whole world, if you traded your soul, that experience would be so bitter and so awful and so devastating, it wouldn't be worth it. What if you got some gain by greed instead of legitimate ambition? I'm telling you, it might taste good up front, but it's going to turn bitter in the belly. And a bit of that advice saves some people from devastation. Say, well, you're right. I better think twice about that. So we must confront all laws, spiritual laws, agricultural laws, basic laws, fundamental laws. We must confront all of those. But you still now can design your own life. A little, a lot, go east, north, south. Okay. So, approaches. Time management might be to step down to something easier that doesn't harass you with the constraints of time. Guy works for a company, says, oh, I got to own one of these, finds out. You've now got to work 24 hours a day all around the crock, and you've got to worry about all these people. The guy says, heck with this. I'm going back where I used to be. I played golf three times a week and made three times as much money as a salesperson. Heck with this running a company. That's the deal, right? Don't put yourself in the straitjacket of something that's not to your choosing and not to your liking. Now, if you really want the prize, you know, to you know, become a multimillionaire and run a company, fine. Then you got to pay the price. But, hey, it, it, it's strictly up to you. There's no requirements here. Where is it written? There is no law. The key is to try to design your life. Yes, you might try something and say, hey, this, this cost me too much. This, I've, I'm away from my family. I'm gone. So this is valid. Little girl said to her, Mommy, he said, Daddy never plays with me. He comes home and he's got this briefcase and he disappears and works on his papers and tells me to go to bed. And she tried to explain, said, Look, your father loves you very much, but he's so busy at work. He can't get everything done. He has to bring it home. She said, Why don't they just put him in a slower group? <laughs> Not a bad idea. If you haven't got time for your kids, you should consider a slower group. It's not the money. It's not the success. You've got to make sure everything works. Not something at the expense of everything. And this something at the expense of everything uh, turns out to be too costly. Life in its best and most fulfilled, I think, is a balancing act to make everything work. A mother's got the challenge. A father's got the challenge. And all of this imbalance, it's, you know, even the tug of war and, and, and trying to make it work as husband and wife with, you know, a little different concepts. Guy's a baseball player and gets four or five million dollars a year and his talent takes him, right? 185 games, whatever the games are that they play. That's a pretty tough one to do. Gone most of the time. Should he go where his talent leads or should he, should he work at the bank from nine to five? It's a challenge. To try to fit, compromise, make it work, make all systems work so you don't sacrifice everything for something. And it's all a dilemma. She says, go conquer the world and be home by 5 o'clock. <laughs> and he says, well, that's a real challenge, right? But 
if you've got partners now, it's, it, it's this combination of working it out. But let me tell you what, it can be worked out. Here's what happens if you ignore it. It just gets worse. You just got to confront and say, let us work it out so that we bless our life with all of the systems that furnish us with a good life. And guess what? It never ends, this trying to balance your life with everything. So in the management of time, step down to something easier, rearrange your program, pick up someone else's advice, not orders, but advice that says, hey, I went for the money instead of and cost me too much. Here's the real time management. Make yourself more valuable. Get more from yourself so that you become much more accomplished in an hour than it used to take a week. That is the easiest of time management, is to make yourself more valuable. So now, let me quick give you the rundown here, some key pieces to time management. Key phrase, either you run the day or it runs you. Getting in charge, mastering the situation, this is the big challenge. I remember some companies I started years ago. I'd start the company. I'm running the company. First thing you know, the company's running me. And along about that second year, I say, hold it, hold it. I used to be in charge. (laughs) And now I'm out of control. I used to have it on the run. Now it's got me on the run. And the same is true whether it's a company or an enterprise or whether it's, it's the day. The key is you just got to take charge. And say, I'm going to start getting a handle and taking charge of my day and not let it get out of control. Because it's so easy to be persuaded and distracted by, you know, things that use up time, take up time. And then first thing you know, it's, it's all out of control. Here's the key we've all learned. Maybe we just need to be reminded. It's not the hours you put in. It's what you put in the hours that count. Guy comes home at night, exhausted, falls into the chair and says, I've been going, going, going. Here's the key. Doing what? Here's what we learned. Don't mistake movement for achievement. Busy, busy, busy. That may not be the deal. It is the doing what that's the deal. Some people are busy all day long doing figure eights. I mean, you know, they're not making much forward progress. Keep coming back around where they started. Here's some time management essentials. Learn to set goals so that you have some priorities. And we're going to take care of that in our workshop this afternoon. Priorities, constant review. Make sure it's what you really want. Let it change. Do whatever it wants to change. Plans to achieve your goals. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Here's another big one on time management. Learn to separate majors and minors. Here's something that requires minor time. Here's something that requires major time. Here's what we teach in sales. All of you aren't in sales, but here's what we teach in sales. Here's the most important time in a salesperson's career. Time in the presence of the prospect. That's the most important time. Time in the presence of the prospect. That's called major time. Here's minor time. On the way to the prospect. Making plans to see the prospect. That's called minor time. In the presence of the prospect. That's major time. Keeping files on the prospect, that's minor time. Thinking about prospects and how it's going to go in the future, that's called minor time. Here's major time, in the presence of. So you've just got to arrange your sales career so that most often you're in the presence of, not on the way to, not keeping books on, not thinking about, not making records for, but in the presence of. So now a salesperson finally suddenly says, well, I can see now where I'm spending most of my time on the minor stuff. And that's what takes, you know, out of a $200,000 potential career, the guy's left now with 60000 Because the 60000 he earned by being in the presence of, but all the rest of the money is missing because he spent so much time on the minor things that didn't count that much. Now, the minor things are important, but they're minor things. Major in the presence of. So a little analysis as to where your time is going. Next key to time management, concentration. 
where you zero in if you concentrate. Many times it takes a lot less time when you concentrate than if you get distracted and, you know, it takes a whole day because of the distraction. But if you concentrate, it could take an hour instead of a day. It could take a few minutes instead of a half a day. Concentration. I used to give that illustration. I read this little article in Reader's Digest. It said, wherever you are, be there. Concentrate there. I used to try to design my day in the shower. And, you know, I'm not even awake yet, and I'm trying to write a letter. What I finally learned to do is enjoy the shower. Don't start the day till you get to the work. On the way, enjoy the way. At breakfast, enjoy the breakfast. Some guys in business, right, they're already at the office at the breakfast table. The key is to be at breakfast with your family at the breakfast table. Plenty of time to do the business when you get to the office. You can't compose the next letter eating your cornflakes. Now you've got to concentrate on your family, right? Wherever you are, be there. Concentrate there. That's a key. Next, learn to say no. It is so easy, especially now in a social society, to just, you know, be pulled everywhere with social obligations. You say, yes, 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 yes. And finally, you find yourself so overloaded with your calendar that it eats up all the time. So learn to say no politely. It's easier to say, I don't think so, but if that changes, I'll call. Then to say, oh, yes, and then try to figure out ways to make the call and not to make it. One of my colleagues says, don't let your mouth overload your back. Because it's easy to just obligate, obligate, wanting to be nice, wanting to be pleasant, wanting to please, right? Just pulled in too many directions by saying yes too easy too frequently and find yourself in a box. Now here's a big one on time management. When you work, work. When you play, play. Don't mix the two. Here's the big one. Don't play at work. Here's why. Work is too serious. Six days out of seven, those numbers alone make it what? Serious. Guess what economics is? Serious business. Economics is a serious subject because you're trading part of your life for being economically sustained and providing protection for you and your family for generations to come. It, this is a serious deal. The one place you don't horse around, fool around, it's at work. At the bar, yes. You know, somewhere else, yes. At work, no. Just establish that reputation that you don't fool around at work. Yes, a little pleasantry, and yes, you know, a, a little story. Yes, you know, to relieve the tension, whatever. But you just, you just don't play around at work. You've got to consider work like the farmer in the spring. He can't play around. He's only got a short season, and you can't go distract him and have him play around. It's, this isn't play time. This is work time. Trying to plant a straight row, get everything right in the short season we got. This, this is no time to joke around, play around. So develop that reputation, not just for other people, but for yourself, for your own self-esteem that says when you work, you work. So don't play at work. Now, here's the rest of it. Don't work at play. You know, I used to be at the office saying, I got to take my family to the beach. You know, we've been, hasn't, it's been so long. What, what does my family think? We got to get to the beach. We got to get to the beach. So I'm thinking beach while I'm at work. Now I get to the beach with my family. I'm thinking, I should be at the office. I should be at the office. What am I doing here at the beach? Now my family's been out of shape because, yes, I'm at the beach, but I'm, I'm also at the office. So here's what I learned to do. At the office, be at the office. And at the beach, be at the beach with your family. Don't mix the two. When you work, work. When you play, play. So, in doing business around the world, we work hard and we play hard. My friend Bailey has a birthday. We all fly to the Waldorf Astoria in New York and have a three-day birthday party. Cost a quarter of a million dollars. When we play, we play. Waldorf Astoria said we've never seen anything like it, which was our intention. <laughs> so, when you play, play. When you work, work. Next. On time management, analyze how you are and see if you can at least be covered. If you're not good at something, get somebody to take care of it. 
instead of, you know, delaying all the time trying to do it yourself. If you tried to balance your checkbook for about a year or two, that's long enough, <laughs> right? Just put the money on some accountant's desk and say, look, take care of this for me. It doesn't have to be very much, just, just so it's taken care of. Either you do it, and if you have to do it, now you have to do it. But hey, sometimes you can let somebody cover for you and get it done so that you can concentrate sometimes on more essential, more important things. If you're a morning person, that's probably the time to get the best of your work done in the morning if you're a morning person. Now, some people, you know, they're not awake at 11 yet. So we call these night people, right? At midnight, they're still flying, right? But at 11, they're not quite awake. So I'm now more of a morning person. I used to be the night person. Now I'm more of a morning person. Way back years ago, I used to say, if God meant you to see the sunrise, he'd have made it later in the day. <laughs> but now I love the mornings. The mornings are fresh and clean. Unique thing about starting the day in the morning, you haven't messed it up yet. You know, the whole day is fresh and clean. Guess what you have in the morning? A clean page. Let's see. I don't want to mess this one up. Let me make some plans here to make this an extraordinarily good day. That morning time is very unique if you become a morning person. But whatever you are, just analyze how you are. Whatever you're not good at, see if you can get it covered. Next, the telephone. Beware the telephone. Way back in those early days, I remember before I learned to just ignore the phone or unplug it. And back then, you couldn't even unplug it, right? You had to just let it ring. And I used to have friends over, and the phone would ring. And I said, just let it ring. We're having a conversation. And people, my friends couldn't stand the phone to ring and not answer it. So they'd go answer my phone. <laughs> they'd say, it's for you. I said, yeah, I suppose it is. <laughs> right? <laughs> but here's the key. With all the, with all the new stuff now, here's what you've got to do at home. You've got to shut everything off and, and have dinner with your family. You, you shut everything off. Now they got it where the messages will be taken and the, everything will be taken. But you, you just got to say, this time, we shut out the world. It doesn't matter if the president calls. It doesn't matter who calls. They, they got to wait for at least an hour till I'm finished with my family. And your family will take great delight in shutting out the world. Just shutting everything off for a while. Plenty of time to get back to it. Say, well, what if, you know, some emergency is happening? It'll have to wait. So, it's very important, the telephone. Now it's so easy, right? Contact the rest of the world. Here's another key on time management. Read the books if you need some specific help. There's a book by Bliss, a book by McKay. There's a book by Lakin. These guys have written books on time management. Maybe something in there might be good. Take their advice, but still make your own plans. You can tell some of these notes I wrote a long time ago. Become more aware and alert as to the, all the new technology now that can save your time. If you're still going chunk, 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 they got some new stuff now, right? <laughs> but those days are long gone, you know. It's even a poor illustration now because kids don't even remember. What does this mean? <laughs> chunk, 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 pull the lever, right? They don't exist anymore except in museums. But become alert to all the stuff that's available, right, to save your time. Stay in touch. Here's another big time management, especially if you're working with people, and that's learn to ask questions before you launch into some tirade or launch into some personal seminar. Sometimes you talk for a half hour, ask a couple of questions, find out you just wasted the previous half hour. Here's what you should have been talking about. So here's the key. Ask questions up front. John isn't making sales. Say, hey, call John in. I'll tear him a new page. Say, well, before you do that, we better ask, why isn't he making sales? Someone says, well, he's not getting up early and getting out in the marketplace. Says, get him in here. I'll teach him some get up early stuff. Well, before we do that, we better ask what? one more question. What? Why isn't he up early and out in the marketplace? So we call John in and say, hey, John, it's got to be something personal. You're not up early. You're not out in the marketplace. 
He says, yes, I never thought anyone would ask. You just ask, right? What is it? Rather than launching into something, save the time, ask the questions up front. Now, here's one more tip on asking questions. Sometimes you don't find the problem until you go two, three questions deep. Because most people don't just blurt out what's wrong first question. Most problems are two, three questions deep. Right away, somebody wants to know if they're not going to, you know, tell their problem to someone that doesn't really care. So you've got to establish some identification. Then somebody's willing to disclose. Kids are like that. Say, how's it going? Say, okay. That's okay doesn't sound right. That doesn't ring right. Something tells you what? It isn't okay. So you've got to have the next gentle question and then the third gentle question. And finally, soon, they say, yeah, here's the real problem. Learn to ask questions up front. Now, here's the last subject on time management. Learn to think on paper. We talked a little bit about solving problems on paper. What's the problem? Three questions to ask. Let me give you some more ways to think on paper. Number one, I keep talking about it around the world, keep a journal. And you've just got to design your own journal. I used to have three journals, one for business, one for personal, one for a book I was writing. That was too complicated. Then I tried three colors of ink. You know, blue means this, red means this. I, I got rid of that. Now I just fill one up and then fill another one up and fill another one up. Personal ideas, a little bit of diary, and that's all it is. Well, here's what a, a journal is. A collection of your notes and, and a bit of a diary and what's going on in your life. It's just a way to capture in a bound volume. Now I used to keep notes on pieces of paper, torn off corners, backs of old envelopes, restaurant place mats thrown in a drawer. But guess what? They didn't serve me well. It was okay for the time, but now trying to find something or going through it, it, it's not enticing. So then I learned finally to start putting it in a journal, a bound volume that's a little more enticing on a winter day to just sit down and, and go back through your journal. But to go back through all these papers, unless you punch holes in these papers and put them in a loose leaf book, right? Because maybe they're important, you want to keep the paper. But sometimes when I'm off somewhere and I don't have my journal, I'll jot some things down. When I get back to my journal, I'll put them in here, throw the paper away. All right? Just little ideas like that. And you just have to decide whether you need a big one or a small one or a light one or an easy one. But just go. Just start keeping more record of ideas that come your way. And whether it's a recipe or an idea, whether it's a colossal business idea or, you know, the schedule for the next few ball games that are coming up. It doesn't matter what. Just load stuff in here and then just load up another one and load up another one. You will be proud someday you kept these journals. It's one of the treasures to leave behind. Let me give you those three treasures to leave behind. Number one is your pictures. Take lots of pictures. It only takes a fraction of a second to record the event or to lose the event by not taking it. Take lots of pictures. I go to Taiwan the first time. I got a 1,000 in my... Seminar. Guess how many cameras? 1,000 cameras. Yeah, they all bring their cameras. Everybody want to take pictures. Here's my new American friend. Here's my new American friend. It takes me longer to do the pictures than to do the seminar. Because <laughs> everybody wants to record it. Everybody wants to record it. It's so easy to record it, but it's so easy not to record it and lose the little bit of tangible evidence of the occasion. So to leave behind, remember the old photographs? To tell the story of a couple of generations ago, the old photographs, how precious they are, how valuable they are, because there aren't that many. So now you change all of that and leave the next generation and the next generation, children, grandchildren, with plenty of photos to express the events and experiences that you've had in your life. Pictures. Next, you leave behind your library. The books that changed your life, the books that restored your health, the books that saved you from oblivion the books that restored your self-esteem and your dignity, the books that taught you spiritual ways, the books that helped you become wealthy and powerful. Leave all that stuff behind. Make sure your library for your children is more valuable than your furniture. I said, yes, I like to have Papa's chair, but I tell you what I wish for most, his library, his books. Then number three is your journals written in your own hand, ideas that you've collected that have been valuable to you. Pass that on to someone else. 
My journals are not for publication, never will be. They're for my family, for my children, for my grandchildren. You know, I publish plenty of things from my journals in my two-day seminars, one-day seminar, you know, albums and videos and, and books I've written. But the journals, this is for my family. This is one of my great treasures to give to my children, my grandchildren, my journals, and my library. Hopefully that'll be more important than my couch. Next, a pretty good idea, a projects book. Whatever project you're working on, get a three-ring binder and keep a little notes on that project and how it's going. When you finish the project, you take that piece of paper out and file it somewhere. But as long as it's active and going, you, you're you a projects book. If you're working with a person, you put a person's name and just keep a little running account of how it's going between you and this person. If you're in sales, if you've got some salespeople, keep track of your salespeople. Give them each a page. Give them each a partition in your projects book. How's it going? The last time we covered this. I'm about to speak to them, so I do a little review of what we talked about last time. Now I'm better prepared to talk to them this time. Here's what it becomes, a briefing book. When the president gets ready to make a trip to Russia or somewhere, they bring him these briefing books. When you were there before, here's what you talked about. When you were there before, here's the promises you made. When you were there before, here's who you met, and here's who they are, and here's what you said. And he briefs himself on all of this so that when he goes again, he says, I remember last time when I was here, these briefing books. This is called for serious students of the interchange of both project and person. A little running account of how it's going. Here's what this person did last month. Here's what they're doing this month. Even with your children, how are they progressing? They started a little project. How's that project going? Well, I helped them do this, and I helped them do this. Right? Is it time for me to right, lend a little more assistance? Just keep a little record of the people and the projects until it's finally finished, and then you file them away. Because here's what you can't study, your files. You know, whether it's in a computer or anywhere, you can't study that. What's best is to have this briefing book. And then now I know you can put it all in the computer and you can study that. But for me, I like the regular three-ring binder and the projects I'm working on, a little running account of how it's going. Now, if you have to part with somebody, it, it's a little easier. John, this is kind of an interesting day, taking your page out of my book. That's a little easier way to say it. Or think of something else clever. This is going to be an exciting day working on finding your next employer. Because <laughs> you want to find sometimes easier ways to say it. John Wooden said it's pretty difficult. Young kid with all the talent in the world in the practice season at UCLA. And when the practice season is over, he has to call him in and say, Bill, you got some incredible talent and no doubt you're going to play a lot of basketball in your life. However, not for UCLA. John Wooden says, you think that's easy? You ought to try it. So you got to think of easiest way possible, right? That didn't make the team. So keeping this account record, I think that's a good idea. A journal, projects book. Next is the day timer, right? You got to keep track of your, where you're supposed to go and who you're supposed to meet. You know, I've got the planes to catch and the I just load that all that stuff in there instead of trying to keep it in my head. I jump in the limo in Beverly Hills to head for the airport. The driver says, what airline? And I say, I'll have to look. Because I don't store it in my head. I don't know, maybe I'm kind of freaky like that. But I say, well, I, let me look. I said, American Airlines, okay, take you to American Airlines. But rather than trying to keep this stuff all loaded in my head, Right? You just find a convenient place to put it where it's all available. And then keep your head open and for bigger projects than what airline. That, that's for me now. You've got to develop your own style of stuff. Now. Somebody says, no, i got to know a week ahead of time what airline. Say, well, you know, I don't bother with that stuff. But that's me. That's my style. That's my personality. You know, that's what works for me. In touch and out of reach. Right? This, this is going to be a new style for me. Next, a game plan, where you just sort of put on a, what we call a game plan schedule, all the things you got to do and take care of. A game plan is, is pretty simple because over here, it has a list of all your projects that you want to accomplish. And then this now is the, like the calendar, let's say six months out. Let's say I'm going to do some training for my company. 
and I'm going to do it in, some of it in this month, some of it in this month. I skip this month. I do some of it in this month. It's the project and then put on the calendar. Because I found out if your, if your project book is one place and your calendar is another place, it gets to be a little confusing. So if you have what we call a game plan, project, and how it's going to work for the next six months. You say, well, I'm going to do some advertising. That's the project. I'm going to do some here, some here, some here, some here. Whatever program you've got going, whatever you want to accomplish, whether it's your health program, I'm going to go to the gym here, I'm going to do this here, I'm going to run this marathon here, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. This is my health program. You see how advantage it is to where the project list and the game plan calendar is side by side instead of one being in one place and another in another place. Now, you've got to put your family on here. Guess what the family wants to know? Where are we on the game plan? So you start talking. Say, no, show me. Wouldn't kids go for that? Show me where I am on the game plan. Say, well, you're right here, and you're right here, and you're right here, and you're right here. That's all I need to know. Don't kids want to be on your game plan? And it's better visual than conversation. Now, let's say you've got a contest you want to run in your company, and you have to go to your family now because you want to use this time. And you, you, you make a deal. Say, look, I got to knock you out of this because I got to run my contest. It's going to mean so much for the business and it's going to mean so much for the family. We'll be able to do so many more things. It's going to go. It's going to go. But I got to borrow this time. Now you have the payback. If you let me borrow this time, we'll pay it back here. And we'll do this, this, and this. And they'll say, well, yes, okay, if you'll also do this, this, and this. I mean, once kids have got you, they're going to go for the max. <laughs> but see, wouldn't kids be more reassured if they knew they were on your game plan, even though it has to change at times? Even though some emergencies or whatever rearranges the deal. Who cares? As long as I'm on the plan. Okay. We simply call this a game plan. The key is for me to stimulate your thinking so that you'll come up with whatever makes sense to you. If this doesn't make sense to you, tear it all up and throw it away. Or, or try it for a while and see if it's too cumbersome, if it's too complicated. You know, because I've got properties, you know, properties on the game plan. Here's where we have to pay the taxes on this one. Here's where we have to take a look. Do we want to sell it? Here's where we have to do some expansion, whatever. Project number one. Project number two. Got to do this at this time. Got to do this at this time, this at this time. Now, if these projects become bigger than just having it on one game plan, now these projects have got to have their own game plan. Here's where we plan to go. If you don't put it on the calendar, if you keep doing it like I used to do years ago called someday. Here was the other one, as soon as. See, that means almost nothing. I tell my girls, as soon as. They knew this wasn't, you know, probably never. You know, as soon as we get ahead, as soon as we get a little extra money, as soon as. There's a lot of things you cannot wait till as soon as. You've got to work them in, work them in, work them in to your game plan. And just commit yourself to both the lifestyle and the business activity and your career. Career, lifestyle, family, spirituality, health, all that's important in your game plan. And here's what's difficult, to try to keep it all in your head. Because the head is full of good intentions. The head is full of hope. It's, oh, it's going to work. As soon as we get this paid off, it's going to work. Say, no, let's put it on the game plan. Right? I talked this morning, right? Someone says, I, I got my to be debt-free worked out. I've been working on it a year and a half, and within a couple of years, it'll all be done. Oh, nothing. My father said that to me. Let's get a plan for you to be debt-free, debt-free, debt-free. Because Papa said... There's nothing like the freedom of no one having a claim on your assets. I said, well, I want to get there someday. I remember the day I crossed the line, debt-free. My parents left me their estate in Idaho. Guess how many debts? Zero. Nothing. Not the automobiles, not the farm, not the land, not the house, not the properties, not nothing. Zero. Isn't that a bit unusual? But isn't that a bit exciting? Unbelievable for somebody to have that kind of unique consistency in their plan, wanting to leave it debt-free. 
Don't have to worry. It's incredible. So you work on a plan for debt free. You work on a plan for your investments. You get a game plan that'll work for you so that all the bases are covered and the balance is, is right. Yes, it's going to get out of balance. When you're balancing your time, here's what you must remember. Sometimes you must work around the clock like spring. Around the clock. Why? It's springtime. So a lot of things have to be set aside till the spring is finished or until the harvest is in. Because you can't postpone the harvest while you do some fun things. You've got to do the harvest and then some fun things. Okay. Is this all helpful? Wow. I'm excited about sharing, seeing if it'll create some value for you. This is the end of this disc. The program continues on the next CD.